Hello, friend. My name is Carter Brothers, and let me welcome you to the first of seven online classes where I will be your tour guide, as together we will spend Lent in Middle Earth looking at the Christian themes in Tolkien's great story, The Lord of the Rings. Specifically, we will discover how Tolkien's great story can illustrate the two Lenten themes of repentance and renewal in order to prepare us for our own shouts of Alleluia as we stand together outside an empty tomb on Easter's morning. Each Sunday of Lent, I will post a new video on the church's YouTube channel for you to watch and inwardly digest. We will then gather together on Zoom on three afternoons for Tolkien Tea Times from 4 to 5 p.m. on March 14th, March 28th, and April 11th to discuss the videos. Email me if you wish to participate at teawithtolkien at outlook.com and I'll send you the Zoom details. Now, before we dive into today's lesson, let me share with you my three reasons for offering this particular class combining Lent and Middle Earth. First and foremost, I hope this series will lead you to experience a more holy and meaningful season of Lent as we journey together to the foot of the cross on Good Friday and then race to the garden tomb on Easter morning. My second reason comes from my love of all things Tolkien. Now, I know there are more Tolkienophiles at second, and this is our chance to gather together and sing our praise for our beloved professor of all things Anglo-Saxon. And my third reason flows from an alleged comment made by one of Tolkien's Anglo-Saxon students at Oxford, W.H. Auden, himself an important figure in 20th century British literature. Auden allegedly divided the world into two groups, those who have read The Lord of the Rings and those who have not yet read The Lord of the Rings. We may hear more from Auden in a later class, but for now, he's the motivation for my third reason, to move more people out of the unconverted or the not yet camp over to our side. With that said, I fully realize that reading The Lord of the Rings can be intimidating. The mythology is vast and complex, all the while packaged in this genre called fantasy, something we'll talk more about in a minute. My youngest daughter, Mary, now a junior in college, recently reread the story again, and she commented how in many places there would be names or places or events mentioned that never end up being explained. For Tolkien, these unexplained references are what make the story more real and more akin to what one experiences reading a real history, where there will of course be references to things that we of a later generation are expected to remember from a prior generation without needing an explanation. I've heard these type of references in The Lord of the Rings described as broken links, which is a great metaphor. Think of how we read stories today on our computers and phones, especially on Wikipedia. When we get to a new name or a topic or a reference, oftentimes it'll be underlined and you can click on the underlined part to link it to the explanation about that word or phrase or person. But do you ever get a broken link that doesn't take you anywhere? It's frustrating because no matter how many times you click it, you don't get the explanation you want. Well, there will be lots of these broken link moments in The Lord of the Rings where you will encounter a new name or an event or a place that never ends up being explained in the text. And to learn more about it, you'll have to read Tolkien's background materials like The Silmarillion or Unfinished Tales. But this is what makes today a great time to read The Lord of the Rings for the first time. Because instead of having to read those background materials, which are even more dense and complex than The Lord of the Rings, instead you can just Google it and you're done. To help avoid too much frustration with broken links, and having to spend too much time Googling, this class will provide some of the much needed background on some key topics that will help expand Tolkien's great mythology when reading the story for the first time.
So we're going to start today's class looking at Lent. Since this class is called Lent in Middle Earth, I need to spend a little time talking about it, which for some of you might be a broken link itself. Because for many, church can be intimidating, like the Lord of the Rings. Because again, there are many terms and phrases and people that get tossed around during a typical service without any explanation for the uninitiated. So I don't want to assume that we all know what Lent is or why we have Lent. So first, let's take a look at Lent. Lent is the season of the church year that links Epiphany to Easter. It runs from Ash Wednesday until Easter, comprising a total of 40 days. Now, if you pull out your calendar and you start counting from Ash Wednesday, you'll come up about a week short of Easter. Because, importantly, Lent does not include the six Sundays during this period. That's an important clue about Lent, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Lent is closely associated with some of the great stories of the Bible, which again provides more clues about the purpose of Lent. During Lent, we are often reminded of Moses leading the Israelites through the Red Sea, which then is compared to Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. More significantly, the Israelites wandering for 40 days in the desert right after the Red Sea crossing is paired with Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness right after his baptism, where he's tempted by Satan. In these pairings, Lent is showing us how Jesus is personally reenacting Israel's story, what theologians call recapitulation. Jesus is in this way fulfilling what Israel was supposed to have been doing. But in the great twist, Lent ends with Jesus on the cross, where we're forced to see that what Jesus meant by calling himself the Messiah was not what we wanted or expected. Lent ends with our hope apparently defeated by the very forces that Jesus came to oppose. So Lent, then, is the season we must go through to prepare us for the proper celebration of Easter. And as we'll see in later classes, this slow march to Calvary's Hill is echoed in Frodo and Sam's journey to Mount Doom. Tolkien, I believe, would have loved connecting Lent with Middle-earth for another reason. We will discuss throughout the class that Tolkien's training was as a philologist, with a special emphasis on the northern languages of Europe, most importantly Anglo-Saxon. He was, after all, the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford's Pembroke College for much of his career. Well, our word Lent comes from an Old English, that is, an Anglo-Saxon word, Lenten, which described the season of spring that period of the year where darkness is giving way to light, where death is giving way to new life. Well, as I typed out this text, I could hear the returning bird song in the trees reminding me that winter is not permanent. Spring is coming. Lent is more than just a time of penitence and preparing for the cross, but it is also a season and time of renewal and preparing for Easter. I wonder if our having lost this connection to the old English word for spring has perhaps contributed to our lack of understanding of the purpose of Lent. And that, of course, is to prepare us for Easter. To do so, Lent focuses our attention on two crucial themes of the Christian faith, both of which Jen identified in her sermon for the first Sunday of Lent. The first goal and the one more commonly understood as a theme of Lent, is repentance. Most people think of Lent as the time to give something up, and that traditionally was a time to give up something connected with sin. We repent by giving up sin and turning back to God. Lent offers us this chance for a probing consideration of our human condition, including sin and its deadly consequences on both individuals and society. Now, again, as George wrote about Lent in this month's second sheet, the season of Lent is a time for self-examination 
in the shadow of the cross. As we consider our tendency to fall into sin and evil, as we confront our own mortality, Lent provides the fuel for our anticipation of the good news that the love of God that judges us and causes us to repent is also the love that saves and redeems us. Our Ash Wednesday service orients us to this time of self-examination. We begin our journey to Easter with the sign of ashes on our forehead, a biblical symbol of mourning and penitence. This ancient sign speaks of the fragility of human life and marks the penitence of the community of faith. These ashes remind us that we are dust, and to dust we will return. It may seem funny that we have to be reminded of our mortality, but Lent is telling us something important. None of us, not the strongest of us, not the wealthiest of us, not the most powerful or the most beautiful, has the power to defeat death. In other words, we cannot do this on our own. These forces working against us, that we in our bodies do not have the power to overcome. We cannot oppose or defeat them by ourselves. We must acknowledge this basic fact if we are to understand Easter. And it is in helping us understand our mortality and the forces that we cannot overcome on our own that the Lord of the Rings excels. And we'll see this firsthand in our second and third classes. For most of my life, my understanding of Lent and its goal of repentance stopped here. But Lent has a second goal, and one that is hinted at in its very numbering. We Christians know that Jesus' story didn't end that Good Friday afternoon. We know what happened on Easter morning, and so the 40 days of Lent do not include Sundays. Why is that? Because Sunday is the day we celebrate Easter year-round. Lent does not try to make us forget Easter, but to help us understand it better. So the second goal of Lent is renewal. Lent gives us the opportunity for an equally intense consideration of the new possibilities offered to us in Jesus Christ and their implications for practical living. Those ashes placed on our head are in the sign of a cross reminding us that while we cannot do this on our own, we don't have to. Echoing what Jen preached in her sermon for the first Sunday of Lent, having died in Christ through baptism, we start our Lenten journey aware of the twin realities of death and resurrection. This coupling of repentance with renewal is present in the very ashes themselves, which are traditionally made from palm branches from the prior year's Palm Sunday service, where we announce the coming of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. It is this hope that gives us the strength to repent, which isn't simply feeling bad about what we've done, but the intentional decision to turn back to God and away from the forces that led us astray. Lent is a time to prepare for the celebration of Easter and to renew our life in the mystery of the saving death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We repent because we know we are forgiven. We can repent because we know that we're not alone. And we can repent because in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has defeated those forces that work against us. So Lent then challenges us to see these new possibilities offered to us in and through Jesus Christ and their implications for practical living. To put it another way, Lent asks each of us, now that you know what Jesus has done, what are you going to do about it? Well, at this point you may be thinking, well, all this sounds well and good, but what does Lent have to do with the Lord of the Rings? I mean, isn't it a story about wizards and hobbits and dwarfs and elves? It's not even a Christian novel, Carter, and let's address these two labels, all right? 
Yes, The Lord of the Rings is fantasy, but it's also a Christian novel, but maybe not in the way you think. To address the question of what is a Christian novel, I'm bringing in another of my favorite authors, Flannery O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor defined the Christian novel not as a novel about Christianity or about Christians or even set in a Christian world, but, quote, one in which the truth, as Christians know it, has been used as a light to see the world by. Notice her definition. A novel where the truth, as Christians know it, is used to illuminate the world. Well, Tolkien knew a thing or two about light, and we'll revisit that in a later class. And building on O'Connor's definition, let's look at a letter written to Tolkien by a man who described himself as, quote, an unbeliever, or at best, a man of belatedly and dimly dawning religious feelings. This letter writer tells Tolkien, you create a world in which some sort of faith seems to be everywhere without a visible source, like light from an invisible lamp. Tolkien's Middle Earth is lit up with this truth that O'Connor said defines a Christian novel. I'd like to think that it is this light from an invisible lamp that moved the writer of this letter to describe himself now as a man of dimly dawning religious feelings. His soul is responding to the truth that lights all of Middle-earth. I shared the same feeling when I first read The Lord of the Rings, and it's something we'll hear more about in later classes. And for those of you who've read The Lord of the Rings, I'd love to hear your experiences during our first Zoom tea time, talking about how you felt reading the book. Well, let's deal now with this fantasy criticism. Tolkien's great friend C.S. Lewis, who we'll hear more about in a later class, also knew a thing or two about fantasy. And in writing his review of The Lord of the Rings, he addressed this question head on. Why was Tolkien using myth and fantasy to tell this story? Lewis wrote in his review, Because I take it, one of the main things the author wants to say is that the real life of men and women is of that mythical and heroic quality. By putting bread, gold, horse, apple, or the very roads into a myth, we do not retreat from reality, we rediscover it. As long as the story lingers in our mind, the real things are more themselves. By dipping them in myth, we see them more clearly. I love Lewis's review because it connects directly with Lent's goal of renewal. Lewis praises Tolkien's use of fantasy and myth not because it takes us away from reality, but it helps us rediscover it. It renews our understanding of what is real. By dipping them in myth, we see them more clearly. Tolkien can help renew our faith because in his story, he gives us new ways to see our reality and make those things that are real more themselves. After the fantasy criticism, people often dismiss The Lord of the Rings as some kind of allegory. When I've taught Tolkien in other settings, Someone will always say that they've heard that the book is really about the atomic bomb or perhaps World War II or something to do with the environment. Well, let's hear what Tolkien has to say about the use of allegory. Tolkien wrote uh, in the uh, foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, I cordially, cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old enough to detect its presence. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author. Here then is a crucial insight into The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien knew all about allegory. He criticized Lewis for it in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Because when using allegory, the author forces you to understand the story as something else. 
Aslan in the Lord in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe must be understood as Christ, or the story loses its power. Tolkien, however, wants to give us a different experience, one where we are free to apply the Lord of the Rings to whatever's going on in our lives. And this is where the Lord of the Rings has so much to offer us as Christians. If you've ever had a conversation with me about anything, at some point you've probably heard me say, you know, this discussion makes me think of something from the Lord of the Rings. In my family, we refer to these moments as the Tolkien reference of the day. I can think of very few other books that have so influenced or reshaped my faith more than the Lord of the Rings because I find it so applicable to my life and it gives me new ways to understand what I'm experiencing. By dipping them in myth, I can see them more clearly. We will see this play out in the course of this class. Well, in addition to his dislike of allegory, Tolkien also got heated when critics dismissed the Lord of the Rings as escapist and not concerned with the real world. Again, Tolkien addressed this point directly in one of his letters. In using escape in this way, the critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, they are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. Why should a man be scorned if finding himself in prison he tries to get out and go home? Or if he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls. For books that are labeled as escapist are often dismissed because they fail to address the key issues of the day, and so the author has deserted her post. But Tolkien is challenging these critics to see escape differently. For an author who provides escape provides freedom. Freedom from a worldview that might otherwise oppress or oppose the reader. And as Lewis has already told us, the Lord of the Rings actually helps us by making the real things more themselves. Now, all this talk of escape and freedom makes me think of Jesus. Let me play a short clip from the uh, Bible Project video on Luke that ties in directly with our earlier discussion of Lent and the great stories of Lent. The Gospel according to Luke began by telling us about the births of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. And in the next section of the Gospel, Luke zooms forward in time. So John is now a prophet and he's leading a renewal movement down at the Jordan River. And all of these Israelites are coming to be baptized. The poor, the rich, tax collectors, even soldiers. Yeah, what's going on here? So all of these people are dedicating themselves to a new way of life. By getting dunked in a river? So long ago, Israel came to inherit this land by crossing through the Jordan River. And God gave them a responsibility. They were called to serve him alone, to love their neighbor and pursue justice together. And we know from stories in the Old Testament that they've failed at this repeatedly. Right. So John's calling Israel to start over, to go back through the river and come out rededicated to their God, ready for the new thing that God's about to do. And so it's within this renewal movement that Jesus first appeared. Jesus is baptized by John and the sky opens up and a voice from heaven says, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, God's words here are packed with echoes from the Hebrew scriptures. This first line is from Psalm 2, where God promised that a king would come who would rule in Jerusalem and confront evil among the nations. And then this next line is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and it refers to the Messiah who would become a servant and suffer and die on Israel's behalf. After this, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days with no food. I mean, that's roughing it. And in this story, Jesus is replaying Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness where they failed to trust their God and so they rebelled. But Jesus succeeded by resisting temptation and trusting God. And so this story is marking Jesus as the one who's going to carry Israel's story forward. After the wilderness, Jesus comes back to the region of Galilee, to his hometown, Nazareth, 
He's in the synagogue and he's invited to read from the scriptures. And he opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Why to the poor? Well, in Hebrew culture, being poor wasn't just about money. It was more about low social status, so women and children and the sick, people on the margin. And surprisingly, this could include people who had money, like tax collectors. They were considered outsiders too, and so Jesus is here for them. Then Jesus continues reading. The Lord has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Freedom seems like a big deal for Jesus. Yes, Jesus was freeing people from their sicknesses, from their past, from their shame, and he was freeing them to become a part of God's new kingdom that Jesus said he was bringing into reality. We will revisit the temptation in the wilderness in later classes, but for day, today, I want to focus on Jesus' first action after he faces down the Satan in the wilderness. As we heard in the video, immediately after his temptation, Jesus walks into the temple, pulls out a sacred scroll, and reads from Isaiah, The Lord God's Spirit is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release for captives, and liberation for prisoners. I like to think of this as the first mic drop, or in this case, a scroll drop. You can just imagine Jesus saying, today the scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it, and he drops the mic or the scroll and walks out. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything God's people have been waiting for. And that means in God's kingdom, the poor will be given good news, the brokenhearted will be restored, and the captives and the prisoners will be freed. This text is part of one of my favorite Lenten hymns, which unfortunately is not in the PCUSA hymnal. It is titled, Now Quit Your Care, and its first verse tells us that Lent calls us to prayer and to trust and to dedication. Its second verse tells us that Lent's goal is not to rent, rend the soul or to bow our head in sackcloth or in ashes, but to be led where God's glory flashes. And its third verse takes on the voice of Jesus telling us, For is not this the fast that I had chosen? The prophet spoke. To shatter every yoke of wickedness, the grievous bands to loosen, oppression put to flight, to fight, to fight, to fight, till every wrong set right. This hymn reminds us that Lent is not just about our repentance, but about our renewal and our work in renewing God's creation. What are we going to do about it? Lent asks. Yes, we take stock of our sin and our inability to overcome the forces that oppose us, we repent of those things driving us from God, but we also take encouragement from remembering that God in Jesus has already defeated those forces and God calls us to participate in God's victory. Lent asks us to look for ways to shatter every yoke of wickedness that remains in place around us and to play our part in advancing God's kingdom. So remember, as we begin together the observance of a Holy Lent, the first goal of Lent is repentance. So I offer and challenge you to pray for forgiveness for and freedom from those sinful habits and patterns in your life that still oppress you. Lent is a season of penitence and self-examination. But don't forget Lent's second goal of renewal. Pray that God uses this season of Lent to renew and strengthen your faith and help you to see where God is calling you to advance God's kingdom here in Roanoke as it is in heaven. Thank you for joining me on this Lenten journey through Middle Earth. Next week, we'll begin looking at the forces that oppose God's kingdom and how the Lord of the Rings can give us new ways to see and understand those forces. 
If you wish to participate in the Zoom discussions on March 14th, March 28th, and April 18th, email me at twithtolkien at outlook.com for details. Until we meet again, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.